it's been incredible. Anyway, I think we I think we can start. So good morning, everybody. Good afternoon for those of us who join from far away. Uh, it's a pleasure again to have you on our Tuesday CAT conference. I'm here with Juan Granada, and we have a great speaker today, Alex Truesdale uh, from Virginia Heart. And Alex, I follow you regularly, uh, seeing the kind of cases you do and talks you do, because you really are an expert in this area of CHIP, of cardiogenic shock. I've always learned from you. So we're really honored to have you this morning join us and teach us. Great. Thank you very much. And as I was just saying before we uh, started recording, uh, number one, thanks for having me. Number two, really kudos to you and the whole you know, Monty Hart team for putting this together and having such a broad reach and for posting these on YouTube afterwards. I mean, I think this is a really fantastic educational program and uh, really impressive how you guys have put it together. So th thanks so much for having me. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to speak on a very uh, narrow, just kidding topic, a chip. So complex, high risk, indicated PCI, what, why, when, who, how. Um, and so obviously I'm not going to cover this entire field in the whole time, but I'll try and get through some highlights and leave a lot of room for discussion because I think there'll be hopefully a lot of debate and questions and uh, comments. Um, here are my disclosures. So objectives, I'm going to speak briefly on the difference between complex, high-risk PCI. Um, <clears throat> I think often these terms are used interchangeable, uh, interchangeably, but they're not exactly so. What are some of the skills uh, you need that are essential skills, how one gets from here to there, and then how to um, build a maintenance program, so to speak. So I think the first slide, and I think everybody has seen this over and over, this is a really fantastic paper. And this really lays out the issue with our contemporary patient population. It's not just that PCI has gotten more complex, but that our patients have become much more ill and much more complex. And this slide is particularly uh, important to me because I graduated in 2013. So to me, it seems like it's been a complete uh, shift in patient population from 2000 and you know, 14 on, much less from this 2004 to 2014. So I'd, I'd love to see uh, you know, an update for 2021, but I think we all know which direction it uh, would be headed. So before we talk about complex, high risk um, PCI, I think everyone has to remember fundamentals first. So part of lifelong learning, part of, you know, to me, being a good interventionist or being good at anything is mastering the fundamentals. And then you have all the essential skills and tools to be able to master whatever comes next. And you may not know what's coming next. So, uh, you know, I kind of highlighted some of these things in the upper left corner. And I'd also point out to everyone, anyone who's not familiar with these um, uh, references that are free and online by Amanos Berlakis, um, you really should check them out. Really phenomenal online resources. Um, a couple other things I'll point you to. So I um, uh, had the uh, privilege of participating with this great group on a uh, SCAI position statement. Again, talking about complex, and we weaved in a little bit about high risk um, PCI. And actually, um, Rob Riley um, uh, led a webinar series that's also available online. So some things to check out. And I don't know who made this other pyramid, but I love it. So it kind of lays out what the complex PCI going from the basics, you know, up to uh, uh, more complex uh, therapies and a schematic for uh, thinking about the work that we do. So first, as I mentioned, it's important to differentiate high risk versus complex. And so this we put together in our paper looking at anatomic factors, um, patient comorbidities, some of the equipment you might use that might make a, a, a case complex. And then there's the risk. Is a patient in cardiogenic shock, cardiac arrest, um, or is this a stable outpatient that's walking in for a planned um, intervention? And so you sort of have to weave through all these different considerations in your mind. The first thing is have a plan. Whatever you do in life, I advocate having a plan. And ironically, sometimes the simplest things are the hardest. So it took me several years to lobby for getting these whiteboards, which I'm sure were not expensive, but um, these are now posted in all the cath labs. And I think the simple utility is, what is the case equipment are we gonna use? It gets everyone around the board. Let's talk together as a team about what equipment are we gonna pull? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do if this happens, if that happens, good or bad? Uh, and sort of that contingency planning. The other thing, 
about having a plan is uh, you can't run a cath lab if you do two cases a day. So if you're going to do six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 cases a day, you have to have a plan. You have to have your equipment ready. You have to have a strategy so that you cannot just be safe um, and efficacious, but you can be fast and efficient as well. Um, you'll, uh, I know you've had uh, talks from experts on IVIS guided PCI. So I will just say that uh, IVIS or OCT, to my mind, if you're performing PCI in contemporary practice without these, you're not performing contemporary uh, PCI. There's uh, some great resources on the web, and here's a, a link to an app that I've highlighted at the bottom. Um, and again, I think the evidence is generally irrefutable at this uh, point in favor of uh, imaging guidance. So um, a couple, uh, here's a quick example and actually a paper. This is from 1992, and I love this paper, and I encourage um, you know, particularly all the trainees to go back and read this paper. And it, all it was was a simple anatomic assessment. And uh, the, if you walk away from no other quote, but the proximal LED diameter is 3.7 plus or minus 0 0.4 millimeters. So, you know, on the other panel, you have a patient that came in with STEMI for stent thrombosis, had a very recently placed 2.5 millimeter drug eluting stent. When I did my initial IVUS run, you can see the distal reference and the proximal reference. So you've got a 3.5 up to 4.25 vessel that had a 2.5 millimeter stent placed. And I always hear people talking about, um, you know, Plavix resistance. And I, I often joke that uh, it's more likely IVUS uh, or OCT resistance. Um, here's another utility for intravascular uh, imaging. Again, as you're doing the building blocks of complex and or high risk PCI and to limit contrast use. So um, I know several of uh, your team and other folks in the local area have uh, mastered the zero contrast PCI. I'm not quite there to that level of Zen yet, but here was a case with uh, diagnostic through intervention with only 20 cc's of uh, contrast for a patient with advanced um, a kidney disease. Again, using uh, intracoronary uh, imaging to measure diameter, to length, to plan your approach efficiently and safely. Uh, vascular access, if you can't get in safely and can't get out safely, it basically doesn't matter what you do in the procedure. And so we're inc increasingly using all kinds of alternative approaches uh, multiple approaches in the same patient, large bore access. And I think it's uh, and key to remember that vascular, both access and closure complications occur more frequently than procedural complications. And yet a lot of times we seem to focus just on the coronary procedure and we forget about, um, you know, the cooking and cleaning is, uh, is uh, more or if not as important as the eating dinner. And I have some link to references below um, so hopefully people can, uh, you know, after the talk is done, reference this as it's posted on YouTube and, and look up some of these great resources. Uh, calcium management. So increasingly, I think seeing, you know, uh, uh, older patients, more complex lesions, and we have a lot more options that are disposable. And really just recently, we now have uh, a lithoplasty is starting to break through around the country, although it's been available in Europe for some time. And along with this, I think you can't decide what modality or what approach until you image. So this, again, highlights the uh, value and the importance of getting information, figuring out your strategy, and then deciding what tools to use. So you don't want to work backwards from picking a tool before you've assessed what the job is. And this is a nice schematic <coughs> here from the SCAI, SCAI paper I referenced earlier. Um, again, there's this uh, app series that I mentioned uh, before. I'm from Mount Sinai. That is great. And also uh, there is a, a Japanese uh, physician codenamed Rota Monster who posts on Instagram and Twitter and really, at least for rotational atherectomy, is an absolute uh, master. And I would look through those slides. Super educational. Um, but again, I think the key here is understanding the different types of calcium locations and thickness and distribution to then decide your strategy. And as you go into practice, you may or may not have um, access to all of these different calcium modification um, uh, technologies, but you wanna know how to use the ones you do well and appropriately, and when you might need to refer on to others. So here's a patient, uh, elderly patient that had an aborted STEMI um, by imaging. This uh, proved to be heavy calcium in the left main and not um, uh, with superimposed thrombus, uh, reduced EF, so ultimately had a heart team evaluation the uh, uh, surgeons, for a variety of reasons, felt that the uh, patient was a suboptimal candidate for uh, surgical intervention. 
And so ended up doing a bifurcation stenting and atherectomy. So you can see how you start building skills. So skills that we're using here, you've got large bore safe access, you've got radial access combined with femoral access. Um, you have you know, intracoronary imaging, you have atherectomy, you have bifurcation uh, techniques. And so these are these building blocks that again, if you're learning them now in fellowship and early career, it, it's easier to add more skills and to combine skills later on. Um, again, different modalities may be important for different uh, lesions. So here is a distal lesion, which actually was, um, I thought it would cross pretty easily, ultimately crossed with a fighter wire, but then a balloon, uh, couldn't get uh, balloons across, ultimately got a sapphire, uh, performed uh, IVUS, and I could really just nose the IVUS in, couldn't get the IVUS uh, uh, catheter through. And here, uh, again, this is assessing what your level of comfort with different modalities uh, is. And I really thought in, uh, for me, with a distal lesion and some other factors that the uh, safest um, approach was uh, laser atherectomy. And, and also, to be honest, sometimes I choose modalities to make sure that I keep up my skills in each of them. So if I haven't pulled out, you know, the laser or orbital or rotational for a while, you know, that also goes through my uh, thought process too, to make sure that you're practiced and rehearsed with these different um, devices. So in this case, uh, laser atherectomy and then cutting balloon, which I, I really like to use to follow after I uh, prep the lesion um, with one of the uh, atherectomy uh, devices. And then again, IVUS guided stenting. And as mentioned before, every time you're using imaging, you're gonna end up using much bigger stents than you have before um, in, in your life. This is a fantastic paper that I would refer everyone to, uh, to. So management of myocardial revascularization failure. I think it really points out what to do when there's been failure, but it also lays out a lot of information to think through how do you prevent failure? So how do you prevent stent thrombosis and stent restenosis? Uh, uh, how do you treat graft uh, failure? And really think through in these patients when they come to you, just like you would in the index procedure, is this patient best suited for uh, percutaneous intervention, surgical therapy, or medical therapy, or some combination of all three. I'm personally, I was so excited to participate in uh, uh, Greg Stone's hybrid uh, trial, and it was uh, really too bad that that um, ultimately was closed, but I, I still think that's a really viable approach going forward. But the bottom line is, I think, integrating all of these different features, but also remembering that if you do a good job the first time, um, you've really made the patient's life better for a long, long time. So here's a, an example. Patient had a bypass, had a patent Lima LAD, had a patent radial to the RPDA, um, had a, a, a older cipher drug eluding stent that was placed within a, a prior bare metal stent. And then in a five month period came back uh, twice for recurrent balloon angioplasty. And the panel on the left is where the patient saw me after the second balloon angioplasty. And the patient's first question was, is the rest of my long life going to be committed to coming back in for a touch-up procedure, so to speak, every three, four months? And I think the point is, if you're just focused on getting out of the room or getting your job done that day, then the answer might be yes. But if you're thinking through a patient in front of you that's going to have another 20, 30, 40 years of life left, you have to think through as a definitive a, a pro procedure as possible, not a temporizing procedure. For some patients that may be redo cabbage. For some patients that may mean um, doing a CTO PCI instead of fixing the vein graft. In this case, um, this was almost two, uh, two years ago and the patient has not yet been back, uh, opted for rotational atherectomy within the stent, cutting balloon, uh, and then put in a, a big uh, stent uh, post-dilated with non-compliant balloon, again, under uh, intracoronary imaging uh, guidance. So again, talking about stent uh, you know, failure, so to speak, I always, I always hear people talk about stent failure, um, antiplatelet therapy failure, and I often have patients ask me like, well, how long will the stent last? And my, my, my standard go-to joke is that the stent itself will be on this earth longer than than I will be. But what they're really asking is how well is that um, result going to last? And that's really on us. So do we prepare a vessel? Do we use intracoronary um, uh, imaging? And so here's a case actually where there was a three millimeter stent with a much larger uh, reference, uh, uh, distal reference vessel. The patient, however, had very suboptimal medical therapy, A1C over 10, triglycerides over 500. 
So I, I actually hesitated <clears throat> and I, you know, I explained to him that I'm only going to intentionally do a temporizing maneuver um, and actually uh, good therapy, although he has not been back and it's been quite some, quite some time, but I fully expect that he will come back, but I really wanted to offer time. I got him plugged in with an endocrinologist, got him started on um, uh, lipid control therapy because before I now place another layer of stent, I want to make sure that this is not going to be a recurring event every couple months. Bifurcation techniques, there's a wealth of techniques out there and a wealth of data. Uh, again, thinking about complex procedures, there's a lot of different, there's been a couple of Twitter discussions about the best way to do the bifurcation, both the technique and to mark your wires. Uh, this is my own personal preference of the uh, fold technique, which um, uh, you know, this uh, I took from one of my fellowship mentors at uh, uh, Brown, who probably took it from their fellowship mentor and so on and so forth. Um, there's a nice app highlighted on the bottom for bifurcation PCI. I think the key is learn a couple techniques, learn them well, learn how to do them, become comfortable. And it's okay to cheat. If you need this, this app up or you need to print up things or put them on the board, that's fine. And when you're in the cath lab, you have a whole team. So enlist your team. But you must have intracoronary imaging, proximal optimization, kissing technique. So these are all these little pieces that are actually very, very important that you have to think through. Um, and again, so it's not just good enough to do a basic, you know, bifurcation without those modalities. And so, you know, then you can get to the point where if you're comfortable doing bifurcation PCI, here's a patient who came in with shock, had a Medina 111 um, distal left main, uh, uh, you know, partially calcified lesion. And uh, had you can see in the bottom left corner, basically, you know, was non pulsatile with a you know, blood pressure of 50. And here I can take a little bit of time to perform a DK crush with imaging um, in a patient in shock with circulatory support. So, again, once you have these building skills and you rehearse and you practice, then they're available to you uh, in emergencies. And that's really the, uh, the key. So, practice makes perfect. Um, I'm not going to have a entire talk. I think this is a talk in itself talking about chronic total occlusion percutaneous coronary intervention. Uh, just a couple things. I mean, really uh, kudos to all the uh, incredible people that have now spent a couple decades um, developing fantastic techniques and equipment that now make my life and our lives very easy. Um, so we have a lot of different options available to us for uh, crossing lesions. There's a lot more evidence to help us select patients better. And a couple of things I'll just uh, point out. I really love this uh, uh, paper by um, uh, Eric Sosemski and uh, um, Bobby Ye that looked at um, concordance of if a patient had a lesion that was a non-CTO, did you revascularize the area that um, was ischemic versus if somebody had a CTO, did you revascularize the area that was ischemic? And as you can imagine, but it was very well documented for them, if patient had a chronic total occlusion, oftentimes the operator, operator would revascularize a different area. And so I think deciding on whether you do CTO, PCI or not, it's important to be consistent and you should be consistent all the way um, uh, through in how you're treating these patients. Uh, this uh, SAVE study was fantastic looking at vein graft PCI. So the um, purpose of the study was to look at uh, uh, failure rates of graft intervention with drug looting stent versus bare metal stent. But my big takeaway, and I think most people's big takeaway from, the, um, uh, from this study was that you have an over 15% uh, graft failure rate at 12 months after intervention. So essentially once you touch a graft, not only do you have to do a good job, but you have to start thinking about what's next. And that may be planning for CTO PCI. And this is important because again, our patients they're, uh, they're not necessarily getting younger, but they're living a lot longer. So whatever you do, you have to think through, is what I'm doing going to be durable for 20, 30, 40, 50 years? And also, um, I strongly advocate, you know, in practice, uh, depending on your scenario, enlist a buddy. I think it's great to have two-person cases. They're more fun. Uh, there's more learning. There's more interaction. The patient benefits. And also, you know, for me in private practice, there's something as simple as it makes no sense to have multiple competing um, uh, uh, operators competing for a small volume pool when we could collaborate all, you know, and have more volume per individual and all get better together. 
Um, and then again, I've mentioned sort of how you build one skill to the next. So here's a, a CTO that, you know, crossing, you know, you're combining rotational ath atherectomy, intracoronary imaging, slow reflow. So microcatheter to deliver adenosine to the distal vet bed. Um, and then you can see the, uh, you know, final result. And again, thinking through the size of these vessels, I often ask my team to guess what they think the diameter is going to be. Um, and, and often everybody's very uh, wrong. But again, going back to that uh, 1992 paper in circulation, I mentioned that when you think about, you know, the uh, typical LAD in that um, primarily Caucasian male population, granted, was, you know, 3.7 plus or minus 0 0.4 millimeters. Um, I think, you know, if you go down this road, then there's other options for retrograde um, intervention. And in this case, this was a very young gentleman. <clears throat> and um, I, part of this was explaining that for some things, maybe we're prolonging your life if it's, you know, STEMI or shock. For other things, it's purely symptom control and for you to understand that. But he'd been through, you know, several months of limiting angina where really he felt he couldn't get through daily tasks, whereas before he'd been a very avid exerciser. And so for him, I think intervention in this case was uh, life altering. So it may not have been life saving, may be not have been life prolonging, but it's life altering. But also when you're putting long lengths of stent in these chronic total occlusions, this is where you also have to make sure that you've really uh, done a good job to fully expand the stent um, and preserve that durability, particularly when you're undertaking this in a 40 year old. So pivoting a little bit to circulatory support, I think most people sort of naturally think about when I talk about high risk complex PCI, they naturally think about circulatory support. Although again, I think there's a difference between complex and high risk and a lot of things, as I've mentioned, sort of roll together as you're um, considering what is or is not complex or high risk. But I really like this uh, paper that was in Jack Interventions 2019. I think it very succinctly and graphically shows physiologically why you would consider MCS use. And it's really that not only are you having these micro ischemic insults, but you can have some macro ischemic insults while you're working. I often tell patients, it's sort of, you know, like if I was trying to change out the walls in my room, I could do one of two things. I could change out the walls really fast before the roof crashes down on me, or I could put up supports. And obviously it's an oversimplification, but in some of these cases, and as evidenced here, you could see that the patient would have had complete hemodynamic collapse without some backup um, support. The tough thing is figuring out who is the right patient. So uh, a lot of really smart people have uh, described and um, Ajay Kurtney and others had talked about, you know, simultaneous overuse and underuse. And I think that's true. And I'm not sure what the answer to that is. I would say that you should at least have internal consistency within your, with yourself, within your partners, within your practice and within your facility. Then I think Hopefully over time, we can all, all grow to complete consistency. But when I'm thinking through a decision algorithm for circulatory support, I'm thinking about the anatomy, patient comorbidities and hemodynamics. And this schematic from the University of uh, Washington really lays things out well. I added a couple things uh, to it. One was ischemic time. That may vary based on how fast you can do a procedure. Um, <clears throat> surgical eligibility of the patient. Is there a fallback option? I'll often counsel patients that, if you die on the table, you die on the table. And I think it's important to have that discussion out loud. But you have to figure out <clears throat> where is your skill level? How fast can you do a procedure? Some procedures I may opt for no MCS just because I think I can do it very quickly. Um, and, uh, and that may be a factor in decision making. So you start building these skills I've been talking about. So here's a, a patient um, with uh, LV dysfunction. Um, elderly, calcium, multivessel, uh, heart team evaluation really got to the point where they felt that their quality of life was not suitable. And so now we're talking about left main intervention, atherectomy, bifurcation stenting, um, uh, 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 vascular access issues with a lot of tortuosity. And so building these blocks together. Here's another person, deranged hemodynamics. So left ventricular end diastolic pressure of 30. So not going to tolerate uh, any further hemodynamic uh, perturbations or any ischemic insults very well. Severe LV dysfunction, ACS, um, has a mix of comorbidities, COPD, not deemed an appropriate surgical candidate for a variety of uh, reasons, and also had uh, vascular access issues. So in this case, um, performed a percutaneous uh, axillary impella uh, implantation. So again, part of this is, you know, you build one skill and it's transferable to another. 
here was a case from uh, over a year ago. Um, a really fantastic patient came in with an EF of 10%. Um, and there was a lot of uh, debate about what to do with this uh, person. The surgeons were worried he wouldn't recover. I think a lot of people, despite a vi uh, cardiac MRI showing viability, thought that there was no way that this was you know, primarily ischemic. Um, he had an uh, LV thrombus, so we opted to use tandem heart. <clears throat> and I'll mention here that I don't do uh, transeptal. Um, I don't uh, uh, often enough to be expert. And so rather than me trying it out, the right answer is I had a structural colleague uh, put it in. And then when I was available afterwards, I had an electrophysiology colleague come uh, uh, help me uh, uh, you know, uh, take it out. And so I think that's the point is know what you can do, know what you should do, know what you do well, know who your friends are and enlist other people. So in this case, uh, fix the uh, had separate ostia, LAD, and CERC, uh, fix the LAD, CERC, uh, and RCA. <clears throat> Ultimately, when he came back, he was not interested in LAD, CTO, PCI, because at that point, he was exercising over an hour a day, and his EF was 50%, and he'd achieved the quality of life that he's interested in. <clears throat> the other big piece of this that gets lost is, and I, I've, said, I've said this to folks before, that I feel like interventional cardiology is increasingly a heart failure specialty. And so I've learned a lot about medical therapy that I didn't know before. So when I think about when I you know, graduated in 2013 from interventional cardiology, two out of the four of these were, did not really exist, at least did not exist in common usage. So half of the medications that I would be currently using to treat my heart failure patients were not even available to me. And so this really, you know, begs the importance of lifelong learning. And this is where enlisting, you know, your friends, enlisting for us, you know, some uh, nurse practitioners, PAs, my heart failure colleagues, so that I'm not just doing a PCI, but we're making sure we're managing all the patient's comorbidities and optimizing their heart failure regimen. And this sort of dovetails into this whole idea of lifelong learning. So it's been my personal experience that probably 50% of my practice overall has changed in the, in my first five years out of fellowship. So what that says to me is I'm not sure where I would be at year 10 or 15 if I'm not keeping up. Um, but I'm pretty sure I would not be able to provide contemporary therapy. And for myself in private practice, a lot of that may be self-driven. So, you know, I often may not have the benefit <clears throat> of having structured, um, uh, lectures, training, um, you know, every day, like fellows or people such as yourselves in an academic environment uh, may have. And so this is really requires myself and our colleagues for us to challenge each other and for me to attend other virtual events like this and uh, learn from, you know, colleagues far and wide. But this is something important for you to think through about how are you going to keep up so that um, you can maintain your competency um, you can treat your patients better. And so you can feel more comfortable. The last thing you want to do is be in a position where you say, you know, I'm not going to do X, Y, and Z, not because I think it's, you know, not the right thing to do, but because I don't feel comfortable anymore because I'm out of practice and maybe I'm uncomfortable asking a friend or a colleague. So you never really want to be in that position. <laughs> the other big elephant in the room, when you're talking about high risk procedures, complex procedures, um, naturally, they're going to have higher complications rate. There's uh, complication rates, and there's <clears throat> a lot of good data about this out there. There's two fantastic papers that I've referenced at the bottom that I would say <clears throat> anybody doing any PCI should read cover to cover and should probably reread every year. <clears throat> there's also this um, app that I've referenced in the bottom, but I think you shouldn't get into PCI if you don't know how to get out of it. So one of my favorite movies of all time is a, a Ronin with uh, Robert De Niro, Sean Bean, and a whole bunch of other folks. Uh, but one of the great quotes is, never walk into a room you don't know how to walk out of. And I think um, exactly the same thing about PCI. And this was a, a quote I actually just uh, stole from uh, Dr. Jesse Courier off of uh, Twitter recently that I really you know like that talks about that everybody who performs PCI must be able to deal with complications and that these skills are teachable. The mental aspects are less teachable, although they are teachable, but they're things you have to help teach yourself. And this is the best part is that in these situations, someone in the room has to avoid panicking and ideally that would be you. And so part of this is preparing 
for the military term, left of boom, right of boom. So what is your preparation and your planning um, and rehearsing for, for bef before the bomb goes off? And then what do you do after the bomb goes off? So again, I really can't uh, highlight enough how important these algorithms are. <clears throat> so here's a couple um, recent cases. So this was a patient that had a intact lima and had a subtotal occlusion of the LAD into the circumflex, uh, heavily calcified, um, opted for cutting balloon and then stenting. And here you can see um, a pretty brisk uh, bleed coming out of the left main. Again, having equipment available, having a mental strategy and a physical strategy available that we were able to deal with this very quickly. Um, <clears throat> did not have to pursue pericardiocentesis. I think we had the equipment and the skills and the entire team um, skilled enough and rehearsed enough that we could really very quickly do, um, you know, rewire balloon tamponade and then immediately switch to a papyrus covered stent. And it's also important to go through your cart, know what size stents, look at that sometime when you have downtime. What are the length of the stents? What is the diameter? What is the, you know, what do they inflate to? In this case, <clears throat> I was able to keep the covered stent in the left main, but they typically don't have the very short um, uh, covered stents. And so, you know, had that happened, had I needed to go into the circumflex, in this case, probably less critical with a lima, but there's still large septal, but, you know, people have published having to then puncture through um, with a stato or other stiff wires and then rescue the branch of vessel. But again, this is not something you want to figure out on the fly. People have published this in CCI. People have posted this on Twitter, but just take the time, go through your cart, go through your equipment and see um, <clears throat> what is the guide compatibility? What are the diameters? What are the lengths? How do I use this? Take time to rehearse these, mentally rehearse and physically rehearse these situations. Here's an instance where I don't... Um, uh, do this uh, anymore. And I did it very infrequently at the time, but had very tortuous vessels and actually used a, a glide wire to come up the arm, uh, did a, a, a PCI, no issue. And then at the end, um, looked at the patient's uh, um, pectoralis muscle and it looked a little bit bigger and it actually wasn't very pronounced. Um, and there was actually just a case in Jack case reports that was very similar that was just posted this week. Um, but in this case, I saw a little a bit of blush off a uh, vessel off the lateral thoracic artery. And again, so um, have I used coils? Have I used gel foam? Yes. Do I do this day in, day out? No. Who does? Our vascular interventional radiologists, they do this bread and butter all day, all night for, you know, a day after day. So <clears throat> while I called for the equipment, I just asked someone to go to the, one of the labs next to me, find one of my colleagues and said, hey, can you come in and let's do this together? And, and that's another key thing is that, you know, uh, for these things that happen less frequently, if you have expertise, don't get in that tunnel. Enlist your team, phone a friend um, and uh, get help. And so we ultimately did a gel foam and coil embolization and the patient did uh, uh, great. <clears throat> this was a, a nice conversation that was just posted on uh, Twitter a little while ago. Jamie McCabe from University of Washington um, you know, posted this comment about, you know, what do you do? A patient um, dies, but then you got to go on to your day. And I think, you know, anyone who does this long enough is going to be in this situation. You have a, a, a patient death and maybe you have three more, four, three, four, five more cases to go. And what do you do about those other patients that still need you? And what do you do about yourself? So this was my response. I think there has to be a pause, not just for yourself, but for your techs, for your nurses, for the whole team. Reset. Think about, you know, what happened, but you got to move ahead. <clears throat> but you do want to carve out some time later to reflect and learn and improve from before. And I, I saw this, uh, and then there was this response from Dr. Bortnick, which I thought was fantastic. The fact that planning a dedicated session to talk about uh, this issue, what are the stress of complications? How do you deal with this? And really to proactively plan through your strategies uh, in training. And so I was really impressed by that um, idea. And uh, one of many ideas that I'm going to uh, uh, steal, which is the value of all of us sharing uh, together, because we can all learn from each other. <clears throat> so in conclusion, and then we'll pivot to some uh, time for discussion and questions. Um, the first step of complex high-risk 
uh, PCI. And again, I think they, the, the people who put together the initial manuscripts called a chip because they specifically wanted the indicated in there. So it wasn't just complex and high risk, but that it was indicated. So you weren't doing unindicated PCI just because we have these fancy new skills and techniques available. So that involves a lot of attention with patient selection and patient counseling. Patient counseling is hard. Um, you know, the surgeons have an STS score that they hold up as the Bible. We have a lot of scores and there was a really great abstract. Um, I think it was published in uh, BMJ or Heart in like, 2014 that looked at um, uh, a number of different PCI uh, risk scores. They were broadly concordant in the low risk patient population and broadly discordant in the high risk patient population, which basically said to me that when we're quoting numbers, they're not very good, but you really need to start talking through to patients. What are the different risks? If you're going to embark upon a complex or high risk PCI, you can't achieve your goals. If you don't set your goals uh, up front. and you got to think about what is the optimum revascularization and what is the optimum um, optimal durability of whatever I'm doing. Do you want to get out of the lab safely? Is that an end goal or is that your minimum standard? We all want to aspire for surgical equivalent outcomes, although in a lot of cases, I think um, with uh, vein grafts and such, I would say that we should aspire for surgical superior uh, outcomes. Quality lesion treatment, so assessing the lesion physiologically and uh, with uh, imaging, preparing the lesion, optimizing stents, and then optimizing medical therapy both antiplatelet therapy and all of our heart failure regimens. And again, if that's not something you feel comfortable with, learn or enlist your, uh, uh, your other general cardiology or heart failure colleagues to help you out to make sure that the patient gets the benefit of full 360 um, full spectrum therapy. Um, although we, we always, uh, everybody sort of posts their big exciting cases. Uh, you know, nobody... So people will, you know, post their championship, uh, you know, deadlifts and squats. They're not going to post, you know, eight hours of training in the gym. So the takeaways, we may think that everything is a left main DK crush calcified um, <clears throat> PCI in a, a 99 year old with uh, no vascular access and an EF of 5%. But that's a small minority of the cases. And the majority of these complex high risk cases also do not require hemodynamic support. And again, I talked about you want to at least be consistent in how you choose, how your partners choose, how your centers choose, as we all learn to hopefully have more consistency um, across the board. Metis meticular vascular access management and closure. So in, um, in case, for instance, with a tandem heart device where I put a 17 French arterial device uh, that I showed earlier, that patient's hemodynamics were suboptimal post pre, intra, and post procedure and left the tandem in for 36 hours. So in that case, it's not just good enough that I get in safely. I have to manage that access and I have to remove it safely. Otherwise, that patient will not realize any of the benefits of my intervention. Um, I think, you know, elephant in the room, volume outcome relationships. Um, I, you know, there's a nice paper a couple of years ago that looked at the average PCI volume uh, in, in uh, the UK was 150 PCIs. And then a, a paper from around the similar, similar time period pointed out that 50% of U.S. interventionalists perform fewer than 50 PCIs, so fewer than one a week. So again, I think the key piece is, um, depending on where you are, some of this may or may not be for you. You have to be honest with yourself and your patients and think about partnering, whether those with your colleagues or if you're in private practice, maybe it's with some of your quote competitors, but how do you collaborate together so you're not splitting volume, particularly with things like CTO, I think is a good example. Uh, train, treat, collaborate, refer. I have referral networks. <clears throat> I have uh, referral networks out of the state where some patients I see, particularly in the CTO realm, where I think this is a CTO beyond what is my skill. And I'm going to send you to any number of people that you know, like Madonna, Prince, uh, Sting, or, uh, or Bono go by first names only, and, and I'll get you to them <clears throat> rather than me just trying it, you know, out. Um, and patients really appreciate that. Uh, I talked about lifelong learning. Again, this five-year 50% rule that you're probably 50% outdated every five years. So if you know that, you got to think about mitigation strategies. And at the end of the day, you want to be a good cardiologist, not just a good interventionalist, a good doctor, not just a good cardiologist, and really a good, you know, um, uh, person. And whether that also includes being a good spouse or a parent or a friend, whatever that combination is, 
um, you know, kind of weave that into your life and practice. And then lastly, I give thanks to my entire team. So I show these cases um, and obviously it looks as if I did all these cases single-handedly with, you know, eight octopus uh, arms. Um, but, you know, none of these cases, particularly the complex ones and the ones with, you know, complications happen without the techs and the, the you know, the uh, nurses. And that includes the, you know, pre-procedure, the intra-procedure and the post-procedure. And then all the patient uh, people that touch these patients' lives um, afterwards as they uh, uh, move on to recovery. So thanks uh, very much for having me. I'll uh, go off screen share and uh, get the get the arrows ready. <laughs> no, there are no arrows. Alex, thank you. That was really great and phenomenal. Our panel here just gets bigger and bigger, as you can tell, uh, because we also have and better a looking. good friend, uh, Toby Rogers, who's here with us today too. Because like, you know, you, you said you have to continue to learn and, and evolve and that's what we're doing. So after years of kind of thinking, I, I, I don't need to know how to do a trans cable um, and Toby telling me I do, I finally came to my senses <laughs> and he's come to teach us today. So I wanted to thank him while, publicly while he's, while he's here. So um, great presentation. I mean, there's something you know, that comes up a lot. Um, I mean, it's just, I think it's great for our faculty and the fellows to see what's possible with complex PCI, because really it has changed. I feel like over the last four or five years, um, the realm of complex PCI and what we're able to do has really taken a few steps upwards. Um, and that may be due to the fact of how we approach it, you know, the multidisciplinary approach, human dynamic support, or just the tools we have. Uh, we, we're tackling much more difficult patients than we ever have before. Uh, and I think this was a great example uh, of that. So I'm gonna see if there's some questions. I don't wanna take up all the discussion. Um, well, just some, so and, far and, some- and While you're asking, I'm just gonna throw out one point. This is sort of a contentious you know, argument that I've had with other people. Uh, you know, there's this, obviously nobody puts a sign on their door saying I'm the non-chip operator. But I think, you know, increasingly there is no non-chip. And so the big takeaway is all of these skills this is contemporary PCI. I mean, that, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it's increasingly so. And I think that's going to be a real struggle for all of us to, to keep up because it's not that there's chip and non-chip. It's increasingly everything is chip. So let me ask you this. I mean, Manath and Thea, in the meantime, you'll come off um, mute and video so you can ask some questions too. That's something I think we all struggle with, right? I mean, you say it's all becoming chip, but there's also to be good at certain things, um, you need to have a certain amount of volume, right? And one of the examples is the study that comes out of the UK registry, the, the British PCI registry, looking at outcomes per operator for left main, right? And showing that clearly you have to do a certain amount of left mains a year as an operator for you to have great outcomes. So... I always struggle with this. I mean, you know, I can understand CTOs and I think CTOs requires a very dedicated group of people in your team who are doing that and who can do, you know, over hundred CTOs a year uh, so that they maintain that standard. But what about everything else, right? And what about left main? I mean, for example, let's start with left main. Um, I'm conflicted at times because the data would say that not everybody should do it, that, you know, few people do it, they have, they have better outcomes because they have more volume. Yet at the same time, for the junior attendings and you know, fellows coming out of training, of course, they, they need to get volume and as junior attendings. So how do we balance that? And what, what do you guys do in your practice, Alex? Well, that's tough. So one, actually, that paper, I think one of the big cutoffs was 10, which was interesting, right? Because you're not talking about the cutoff for that left main was you have to do 100. I mean, it was, it was 10 a year. So it's really interesting, even when we're thinking through what those bars are. So that's a tough one. So one, I'm in a, a benefit. I'm uh, in a, a large private practice. So there's 50 of us. So some of it is right sizing the interventionalists. So there's a lot of groups that came up that had nine folks and eight of them were interventionalists and everybody read nukes and everybody read echo and everybody, right. So everybody was great at everything. And, and then you've got a problem there in contemporary practice. I think, so I benefit from that. We have our number of, you know, eight interventionalists, including, you know, structural vascular for a group of 50. 
is already sort of sized appropriately to help with some of that, to maintain, there's clearly a volume outcome and volume competency relationship. But I think there's other things that then you have to think through and when is it appropriate to double scrub? And, and these are discussions you have to be honest with yourself and your colleagues have to be honest. Um, <clears throat> When do you bring in proctors? When do you go and get additional training? But, but the double scrubbing piece is, is important. And then where do you think, you know, my, my first job out of practice, I did a lot of vascular and I did uh, below the knee. And then when I moved to Virginia, there, that volume wasn't there. There were other people. And I, I stopped doing it because I looked and I realized I have vascular interventional colleagues that are doing five, six times my volume. So I'm going to refer to them and I'm going to do better at this. So that can be tough, but there's no master strategy like in some other countries. So a lot of that is going to be just frank discussions, I think, within your groups, within your colleagues and within your quote competitors about figuring the best way to do it. But that, that's a, that's a tough one. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Manaf, where did that Manaf go? Thank you, Dr. Trisdell. That was a great uh, whirlwind tour of, um, um, uh, chip and high risk procedures. I had a, a question about how you um, how you structure your uh, chip team and um, and what your kind of practice is for uh, deciding on strategies for patients, um, deciding which which how how your patients are referred in and which patients you're going to do how and and uh, um, and those kinds of things on a. Similar note, I wanted to ask if you had any um, uh, experience or knowledge about CHIP fellowships and where, where, uh, where CHIP specific training uh, fits into all of this. Um, is it uh, something that you know, more and more you think we'll need to start learning in fellowship or is this something that comes you know, sort of in the early uh, years of attending CHIP and, and how that fits in? Wow, two, two really, really great and important questions. So I'll take the first one. So your first question about the, the structure of a chip evaluation, a chip team is a great one. Um, so when I came to the, uh, Northern Virginia five years ago, um, there was a lot more parallel work. Um, um, and just using a snapshot, I think in the year before I got here, there were seven impellas used across the center. I'm not saying that's the be all and end all, but just a snapshot of of something. The next year was a hundred. So just a snapshot of in 12 month period had things had moved, but we had a lot of parallel work. <clears throat> what we've now developed is over a couple of years is a chip note template in Epic so that we collect similar information. And we've had, um, you know, uh, NPs and PAs that are sort of blind. They're, they're available to all of the different private practice groups to help make sure that we standardize the evaluation and that if I'm, you know, if I'm seeing patients in the office and I'm going to a different hospital and I'm scrubbed in, that they're making sure that patients get the benefit of the standard evaluation, that every patient ideally gets the most similar care Monday, Tuesday, AM, um, PM, and that we all agree together and that we encourage <clears throat> double scrubbing and that in a, ideally moving towards a model where I think Maybe that second person, maybe even from a different private practice group. And you can work out billing. This has all been solved in TAVR, right? Where surgeons and interventional cardiologists have already figured out ways to manage that. So we're sort of along the evolution, but having a structured evaluation, um, deciding have some criteria for who may need anesthesia and a way to get anesthesia support, um, have a group discussion, about who may be uh, for different approaches and then have follow-up case reviews. So we have a chip meeting every two weeks, um, but we have a lot of ad hoc stuff that goes on in between. So trying to build some structure to that. So that's kind of the first answer. And that's been evolving um, for us. And I think it's important when you have a lot of parallel work groups to get people on board and working as similar as possible. Um, the second thing about training is so there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat. I'd, I'd been in the army for a number of years. Um, so my wife um, uh, told me I had to get a job before my 41st birthday. So I didn't have the opportunity to do an, a second interventional year uh, unless I wanted also to get a second family. So the option of doing a chip or whatever fellowship, although I think they were not quite there yet, wasn't there. Um, and so I did a lot of on the job training and some of that was job selection. 
you know, I went to a job not asking about what money do you give me? What this, what, but um, what am I going to be able to do? Who's going to be here to mentor me? And some interviews, people were, were saying, what do you mean? Like you're, you get here and then you get cracking. And, you know, I, I said, okay, thanks. I want to know who's going to help me get to the next place. And you'll find your, if that's what you're asking, <clears throat> You'll find the right job for you. What opportunities? Um, <clears throat> uh, industry courses, um, talking to you know other people, learning on Twitter, learning on the internet. So there's a lot of, of a lot of stuff available. And then you meet people at ACC, SCAI, CRF, CRT. You, you know, and this is how it grows. Um, <clears throat> to me, if you have the time, uh, either by age, by family situation, by economics, to do a chip fellowship. I mean, what? to do another 500 cases. So I have a 500 case interventional year, and then I can do a second 500 case interventional year. I mean, there's no substitute for that. You do the math, how many years of experience. So that's a no brainer. I mean, to me, if you can do that because your personal situation accommodates that, you know, that's a no brainer. I think it's contentious whether we should mandate an additional year of training. I think there's been a lot of debates about moving from three plus one to more two plus two, or three plus two, or other type of models of training. Um, but yeah, I would encourage, and even if you don't go out and become, quote, a chip operator somewhere, those skills will translate to everything you do. And that experience of doing an extra, you know, 500 pieces, that's 10 years of practice for half of the country of interventional cardiologists. So you know, that's easy. But there absolutely is a pathway if you if you don't, and that's courses, that's training, that's colleagues to your left and right, um, and and I think that's really well mapped out a lot more in both directions. And um, I'm not aware of all the different fellowships, so I don't want to shortchange one or the other. I know Henry Ford has one. I know uh, Columbia um, has one. I know University of Washington has one. Um, but I'm, I, I think there are others. And again, I don't want to exclude anyone um, uh, out, else that are out there. But the nice thing is now with Twitter and email, just email all those people and say, hey, ask the current chip fellows where, you know, where can I go? What do you recommend? And get their, you know, thoughts and, uh, and advice. So great question. Thank you. Theo, do you have a question? Yeah, I would like to ask, um, first of all, you know, it was a great question, a great uh, topic and discussion. And uh, thank you. Um, now we're about to graduate in about two months, you know, we'll be considered as attending, we will be able, we'll be required to do procedures on our own, and so on, right? So my question to you is that, how do you manage the, the transition from the fellowship to being an attending independent operator, and especially I'm talking about the more complex cases, what are your tips or advices you can give us to, because, you know, I personally, I don't feel comfortable to do all the cases on my own, especially more complex cases, you know, mechanical circ circulatory devices or, you know, so what's your, uh, how do you build up your confidence and your skills? And um, do you have any tips or advices? Yeah, another great question. Um, and I'll give it to you from two perspectives. I'll give you the perspective of what I did right out of fellowship. And now from, um, I just had a colleague who just came out of fellowship and started with us a couple months ago. So I'm sort of on the other end of it. <clears throat> on the first piece, again, it's figuring out that, that question about what job do you go to? And that was a question I asked. I asked people, and I think in some interviews, they were thrown off because they wanted to know what was I going to do for them. And I wanted to know, what are you going to do for me so that I can do for you for 10, 20 years, <clears throat> right? And <clears throat> so where is that mentorship? In the beginning, whether that's six months or 12 months, you have to just not have a disaster. I mean, it's really important to build your end, to build those relationships, to show that you can do things well. So do all the fundamental cases well. Ask for opinions on everything. Turn to your colleagues from left and right, um, you know, earn their respect. Double scrub. So if you have a complex case and you're going to refer it to a partner, don't refer to a partner, refer to a partner and figure out an accommodation where you can double scrub with you as first operator. And, and so that's something to you know, work through. So being on the other end, um, and, and I'll say one more thing. You know, I remember in my first job, I was told in my first counseling session that I'm doing too much radio. 
I was doing, I was doing like 90% radial and they thought I was doing you know, too much that really the sweet spot was probably around 60. And, and I, and I really, they really bothered me. And I went home and I had a lot of trouble that night. And then I thought through it and I thought, you know what, I understand what they're saying. It's new to the lab. And so I realized, no, I'm going to do 90% and build to 99% radial, but I'm going to think through why someone made that comment. Was I, how am I going to bring the lab along? And, and so that was a really interesting thought experiment for me about where you're going to put your foot down. Whereas in other things, if somebody says, you know, Hey, you know, you should or shouldn't do this from a senior partner to think through, well, maybe they're, you know, maybe they're right. Um, so now having a junior partner that just came out of fellowship, for instance, he works primarily out of a satellite hospital. And I told him, I don't want you in a situation where every time you have a complex case, you then say, you ship it to me and I do that for you, right? Because he's going to be working a, a lot longer than I am. Um, so I said, look, you know, you, you obviously do what is safe and judicious. If you have a complex case, let's figure out how to do them at the mothership lab with me. I'll be more than happy to, uh, you know, sit in the control room and point and make good suggestions, uh, you know, and uh, I'm you know, teasing, right? Just come up with great ideas. Um, and you do, you know, you do the work. And I think that's a win-win. That's a win for the group. It's a win for him. It's a win for me. And so some of that is, again, you thinking through how you build those relationships. But in the beginning, do what you do. Do the low-risk cases right. Uh, be kind to the staff. Um, develop a good reputation and talk to your colleagues and, and the rest will all, will all follow. Great, Alex. Uh, thanks a lot. Any comments from two of you? Very quiet over here. No, I, I just have a comment. Um, and it's about uh, complications, right? You know, one, one of the things is that um, we always on the educational uh, um, side of things, we always go to the back end and assume that people know how to diagnose complications. And, and you know, we, we teach how to treat complications, but for me, the struggle is how to teach the decision-making process. Because this is, this is the most challenging thing. And I keep telling Azim, you know, is once you identify something is abnormal, how do you go to this flow chart that is not really easy to teach because every single operator has different set of experiences and, and, and I just wanted to ask you, I mean, do you have any suggestions about what would be the most effective way, other than getting a whole bunch of experienced operators to share their experiences? How do you, you, you are talking about the military, right? They, they have processes to teach decision-making. I mean, how do you go to the process of decision-making to really go to the final um, outcome, which is treating the complication the right way? But the thing is, the problem for me is not really treating the complication, is how to teach people to identify, diagnose, and make the right decision. And this is something that you struggle all the time when we're building programs, educational programs. I'm like, how do we do this? How do we teach people to actually think through a complication um, and actually get to the point in which they make decision? And then you teach how to treat it. Mm -hmm. I yeah, know it's a difficult question to answer. No, no, right that's, 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 uh, yeah, that's great. So when you figure that out, just uh, call me. But, uh, <laughs> um, We're working and, on it, by the way. Okay. Working on it, but I wanted to get your opinion. Um, so again, I think, you know, if you remember, I had, the, so the slide was left of boom and right of boom. So right of boom yeah. is the bomb went off. So there's certain things you can do after the bomb went off, but there's certain things that exactly. are now un unfixable. So the left of boom is, you know, so what, um, I'm going to do a PCI from soup to nuts. What is from entering the radial artery or the femoral artery, then you know, accessing, then getting to what are all the different things that can go wrong? So some of it is reading through those algorithms just to get your mind thinking about those. Some of it's something as simple as, you know, I always tell my, um, the, you know, the techs, I said, look, you know, I'm a very hands-on person. I do a lot of stuff myself. And, you know, and, and they, and they know, and they make fun of me. Like I, I load the wires and I load everything myself and I load the balloons and I do, but I tell them like, I need your brains because what I can't do is I'm flying the airplane. I need a co-pilot and I need all these other people doing things. So if, if you're a tech or a fellow, whoever that's just passively, that you're going to do a, when I say a or B, when I say B, I'm that, that's not the person I want by my side. I want the person that is tapping me in the shoulder and saying, uh, excuse me. And, and that's setting up that cockpit 
where people feel comfortable going up to the pilot and saying, you know, the plane's crashing while you're looking for the ashtray. Um, <clears throat> you know, so I think some of it's that. So some of it's thinking through what are all the potential complications and being aware every time you go in that there's going to be a complication. And, you know, with some of these papers and courses, people sharing um, and, and, and highlighting that. And that's a big deal because as these patients that, you know, that Charleston Morbidity Index, the patients are getting sicker, procedures are getting complex, more complex. Those complications are going to increase. And if we can keep them the near miss ones, the small ones, you know, that's, that's, that's great because they're going to increase and they are. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think just attention um, and then also having a team. So not just the team in the cath lab, but you know, who's the team making sure did they get their antiplatelet therapy? Did they pee before coming in the lab so that they're not agitated on the table? Um, who is, while well, you're scrubbed in the next case, who's going to go check on their wrist or their groin? Who's going to go check on them? Who's going to deliver their medications? I mean, all these little things is building this team so that, you know, that Swiss cheese model, the more, uh, you know, the more pieces of cheese, the less likely you're going to fall all the way through. So that's probably another aspect, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Alex, maybe one last question, and then we, we're on the hour, so it may be a good time to stop. I think one of the challenges I still see, and you know, having worked in multiple continents now, this is my third continent where I, I practice as an interventional cardiologist, there's certain things that are very similar no matter where you are in the world. And one of them, when it comes to complex PCI and CTOs, unfortunately, that's pervasive in our field, is the fact that for many of our colleagues, if they see a lesion which they can't, cannot treat, it's then not treatable, right? The, the sort of uh, unwillingness to refer a patient to a colleague because a colleague may be able to tackle um, this more complex lesion in a very safe way uh, is still something we struggle to do. Uh, and as a result, many patients, I think, don't get offered therapies that would be very beneficial. And some of the case examples you showed today are, are very typical of that. I mean, any advice on how we, I mean, how we get over that? Is that something you struggle with in your current practice or has that changed? No, absolutely. So one, I think for me personally, like I said, CTO is an example. There are certain levels of CTO when I look at it and I just say, <clears throat> you know, I know a guy or a girl that can do this and you should go to, you should, this is a level 10 and I'm not level 10, you know, and there's not something I'm going to try and I'm okay. Okay with that. For the other things, on the other receiving end, I think some of it's about um, educating my colleagues about what you may, have, particularly the general cardiologist, about what you may have thought was doable or not doable 10 years ago is not the same. And just, hey, anytime you have a question, send me an email and I'll look at the angiogram rather than people just coming in and people reading the report of the angiogram. Right. Um, also enlisting our uh, NPs and PAs, because we have a lot of NPs, PAs that are seeing patients immediately post-procedure and seeing people in between to tell them, look, you know, the physician's got a 15 minute appointment, they're busy, they're burning through a lot of different stuff. But for you, if you see somebody and they're having angina, just email me and I'll look through the, uh, I'll look, I'll look through the angiogram, you know, um, uh, you know, off hours. And we can at least look at this as, as an option. And I think also just us collaborating more together. So again, I work with people from different. Oops. He just froze. Alex, I think we just lost you. Yeah, we just lost his connection. Oops. Anyway. Um, I think this may be a good time to stop. He's back. He's back? Uh, Alex, we lost you. We lost you oh. right at the end. You froze. Sorry I, about I, it. I just said, I just gave you the solution to all the problems of the world. It's too bad you missed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that happens. <laughs> we won't even have it on the playback. <laughs> Listen, that was really fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Um, looking forward to seeing you in person soon. At, you know, hopefully, as in-person meetings come back. Uh, it would be great for us all to get together and have a drink together. Uh, we Deal. really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks really.